Thank you very much for inviting me to talk here. I'll use the iPad to be able to write on the thing. Let's see, hopefully the technology will be uh, favorable. Um, yes, so I want to talk about effective equity distribution and all I'm going to say is joint work with Elon Lindenstrauss, Ahmed Mohammadi, and Andreas Wiese, a former student of mine who is actually looking for a job. We'll come to that. <laughs> so frequently I run into this issue that I keep talking and talking and talking and then the time is up and I didn't even state the theorem, so let me not go into this problem today by starting straight away with the main theorem and talking about the yeah, the various things appearing in the theorem and why you might be interested in it and then talk about the ideas that go into the proof. As said, this is joint work with Elon, Amir and Andreas. We are not yet done. We kind of have a preprint of 80 pages. We are proofreading that. Maybe a section or two are not yet read so often and things are changing a little bit, but yeah, it's a non-trivial project that we have been working on for quite some time and we are close to finishing it. So what's the statement? We take two groups, um, capital G inside SLN and capital H. They're both semi-simple, both simply connected, say over field F, uh, number field F. And then we take the adelic quotient of G and we take kind of the adelic quotient of H, but we use an isogeny to send this adelic quotient of H into the space X. So I'm thinking of X as my ambient space, and then as the H kind of as my acting group that defines an orbit inside the ambient space. And there's a little G in, in addition here that is, um, supposed to allow myself to distort the, the H orbit further. So this G is an abdaria delic element of capital G. So this is this YD. This YD is a kind of a nice closed orbit inside the ambient space X. And once I've fixed my dimensions, so the capital N most and the, the number field, then there exists, there exists two constants. Uh, kappa greater than zero and capital A, depending on these data, only on the dimensions, so that when I look at the measure sitting on the orbit Y and compare this to the measure, the uniform measure over the whole ambient space, I get an equal distribution with an error. And on the very right, I see a dependence here, I see a dependence on the function. So I need to know the smoothness of the function, or at least the, the C1 norm of the function. And I need to know the level of the function. And I think of these combinations, as C1 norm and level to some power, I can think of this as a sort of an adelic sort of norm, kind of. And this is also how we actually treat it in all of the proof. And then at the very end, we sort of make it appear in terms of C1 norm times power of the level. So that's the only dependence of the error of the error in terms of the function. Then there is a dependence on the ambient space and the CPL stands so for the complexity of the ambient space. Or you should maybe think of it as a height of the of the group G or as the discriminant of G or of X. And below there is another quantity which we call min complexity. And yeah, let me define the, the complexity first of X and then talk about the min complexity. Sorry. So complexity of X that I would define as, well, as I said, it's kind of the height of G. And furthermore, you can, def I think of it or define it as you take the product of all variations of the norm of, let's say, WG, 
norm of it with respect to the max norm at the places V, where WG is an element of the corresponding wedge of the Lie algebra of G, a Q point of that, right? So that maybe the, all of that is sitting inside the corresponding wedge of the little Lie Lie algebra Lie, little SLN. And in SLN, I just fix a norm uh, using the max norms kind of in the finite valuations and it doesn't matter which norm in the infinite valuations. So it's kind of a height. Why do we call it complexity? Because when you look at the theorem, when you look at the theorem, um, in Y, there is the possibility of this deformation G. And when I define the complexity of my deformed G, I sort of go in the long, along the same method. I define the product of all valuations, norm, but now I use this deformation inverse applied to the corresponding Lie algebra or wedge element of the Lie algebra of H. Again, norm of that, and I'll, yeah. So this time it's in the wedge of dim H, D of G, D of H of Q, inside the same wedge dim H of SLN. And now you see that I'm using the, the G in addition inside the definition of the height. And maybe that's a bit unusual and that's why we call it of the complexity. And what's then the mean complexity that appears in the theorem? So the mean complexity of Y is the minimal complexity of an orbit of a proper subgroup containing Y. And let me just explain this a bit more. I'm thinking of my ambient space X as some kind of blob, that's my space. And then I'm trying to prove equidistribution of my Y, which is a small dimensional thing inside the X. And now I'm running out of dimensions to explain what I'm thinking. So maybe there's an intermediate orbit, some set, which is that's maybe y is three dimensional at least, then the x is maybe, I don't know, 15 dimensional. And the yellow line is kind of an intermediate object of dimension uh, five, whatever. And it could be that my blue line is stuck inside the yellow object of intermediate dimension. And the blue line is very complicated. It's it's in terms of volume, in terms of complexity, in terms of height, algebraically or sort of geometrically, it's a very complicated thing. But it's sitting inside the yellow object, which is not as complicated. And then the blue Y will not be equidistributing in the ambient space X. There's no chance for that. And hence my my error should not be related to the complexity of Y, but should be related to the minimal complexity of Y, because that minimal complexity will potentially prevent equidistribution in X. So that's how you should think of um, that theorem. And I think now we are kind of complete in the explanation of what's happening. As said, capital G defines my ambient space. It gives me this Adelic quotient. We, uh, in this paper, we are assuming that G and H are anisotropic, so my X is a compact quotient. That's how I drew it. The Y inside it is obtained from a rational subgroup H, but it's also potentially deformed by this little G. And this gives me this, in, this orbit 
or period inside the ambient Adelic quotient that I want to consider. And then I compare the integral of a test function with respect to my orbit measure on Y. I compare this to the integral of F over the whole space, always using Haar measure, uniform measures. And there's some absolute constant depending on the, on the dimensions and polynomial and discriminant. Then the complexity of X enters in a hurtful way, but only by some power of the complexity. The Sobolev norm, or maybe a Delic Sobolev norm of the test function enters on the very right. And the mean complexity will help me to prove the equidistribution. If the mean complexity is kind of large, then I have a polynomial de decaying error weight. So that's the, that's the theorem. Okay. Yeah. So let me tell you a little bit of the history of, of these kind of statements. And in some sense, this is an effective version of the moses Schaaf theorem. Um, they proved this wonderful, very general statement that X be a quotient of a Lie group by lattice. Let mu n be a sequence of probability measures that are invariant and ergodic on one parameter unipotent subgroups of G. Suppose that the mu n converge to mu in the weak star topology. Then either this limit measure is the zero measure because I didn't tell you that X is compact in this theorem. So X might not be compact, it only has finite volume. So there's a possibility of the measures to be sitting more and more outside compact subsets. And then the limit measure might be the zero measure. That's a possibility. Or the only other alternative is that the limit measure is again invariant and ergodic and probability measure for one parameter unipotent flow. And this theorem builds crucially on Ratner's measure classification and important work of Daniel Magulis called linearization and non-divergence. Um, and it's kind of a prototypical theorem from, from homogeneous dynamics because we go to the limit and then study what's going on. And that makes it very powerful, very general, but precisely the error that I was interested in the first theorem that I presented, that error is kind of gone because I really only talk about the limit and not about how quickly I achieve the limit. But it's a very general theorem, much more general. It's, uh, yeah, yes and no. So this is a, a real theorem in the real setting with a Lie group. There have been generalizations to S arithmetic setting, but we'll come to these fine points in a minute. To some extent, there was a striking application of this moses Schaaf theorem precisely about positive definite quadratic forms. And that's the theorem of Ellenberg and Venkatesh. And it concerns sort of a big quadratic form and a small quadratic form. And the big means more number of variables and small means less variables. And the first version of the theorem is we take capital Q, a fixed positive definite quadratic form on C to the N, then there exists a constant that only depends on this capital Q and of course the dimension. So that if I have a quadratic form with at most N minus five variables and this smaller quadratic form with less variables, this little Q is everywhere locally representable and has square free discriminant and has minimum at least this constant, then it's also globally integrally representable. So that means I can find a subspace, an integer sublattice of dimension M, so that when I restrict capital Q to this sublattice, I actually get this little Q quadratic form. And of course, the locally representable assumption is precisely this property for the localizations at all times. So I want to be able that inside CP to the N, I can find a rank M 
subspace subgroup so that capital Q restrict to this rank M subspace is equal to little Q. And if this works for every prime, then I call this everywhere locally representable. And the global, the local global problem here is precisely if I'm locally everywhere representable, is it then also globally really representable by choosing a basis in C, uh, M linear event vectors in C to the M, N. Right, so there are kind of two versions of the theorem. Um, the first one is where the gap in the number of variables is at least five. And in the second part, they suppose the gap in the number of variables is three, but insist that the quadratic forms in question, I have square free the discriminant indivisible by P for this fixed prime. And it's kind of a splitting condition, maybe akin to a Linux type splitting condition in other problems. And I'll, we'll see somehow why this comes up. And I want to explain a little bit the relationship between the moses shah theorem and this application of Ellenberg and Venkatesh. And the basic idea of this connection is precisely, we can look at um, G, sorry, we can look at G equal to the spin group for the big quadratic form Q, and we could use this to define a homogeneous space. Of course, it's, it's a compact homogeneous space, but somehow for the wrong reason, because the real points of the group is compact. But yeah, we can still look at it. G of R mod G of C. We can look at this real quotient. But then, because it, G of R is just compact, it will not have interesting subgroups. It's kind of yeah, not particularly interesting. Because of that, you actually try to look instead at the periodic extension. And I draw the periodic extension maybe here. That means I look at G of R cross QP mod G of C bracket one over P. And if I would have strong approximation, I would sort of have a projection from the extension to the original homogeneous space, except that I don't have that in the setting because my G of R is compact. I, I don't have a theorem that like that. Instead, the periodic extension is not just an extension of my um, homogeneous space. It's kind of an extension of finitely many homogeneous spaces at once. So there are kind of other homogeneous spaces that are attached to, to my group, to my quadratic form. And they actually arise from the spin genus of the quadratic form, from the genus of the quadratic form. So they're kind of equivalent and locally indistinguishable um, quadratic forms, indistinguishable from capital Q. Same number of variables, also positive definite, and at every prime, prime they are indistinguishable over CP to capital Q, but they're only finally many of these. And it's the periodic extension is kind of a common periodic extension that builds an umbrella over all of these um, real quotients at once. And what then happens is that I, there's the CD mass formula that tells you that if your small quadratic form Q is locally everywhere representable, then it is represented by one of the quadratic forms in the genus of Q. So in some sense, there is, there is a representation of your little Q in one of the other homogeneous spaces, which corresponds to another point in the adelic extension, in the periodic extension. And what you then, it's kind of a very clever algebraic trick. It may also have existed in parts before, but it really clever usage of this idea by Ellenberg and Venkatesh, they look at the 
point-wise stabilizer. So there's a subspace attached to this to this green dot here, or to this quadratic form here. There's a subspace attached, so that on this subspace your big quadratic form is kind of related to your to the little q that you want to represent. And you define the, the subgroup as the pointwise stabilizer of this subspace that is attached to this representation coming from the CB mass. And this gives you then an orbit that you can think of in this extension, which will be a closed orbit. And the complexity of this closed orbit, the, the volume, the total volume of this orbit, kind of is reflects the discriminant and the complexity of the quadratic form. So if the quadratic form becomes more and more, the little quadratic form Q becomes more and more complicated, its discriminant gets bigger and bigger, then the green line will have more and more volume. But in fact, more is true, and this is what, what Ellenberg and Venkatesh realized, that if you know the minimum, they have here this important assumption that the minimum of the small quadratic form is at least a constant. If you have controlled this minimum, then you're not only controlling the discriminant of the little q, but you're also in some sense controlling the minimal complexity. So the, the minimum will also know whether you are trapped inside a smaller intermediate orbit. And by ensuring that the minimum is big enough, they can ensure that the picture is really like that. And in particular, there will be a point on the There will be a point here on the orbit that kind of produces a new point inside your homogeneous space. And precisely because of this picture, they are able to transport the information that this original gravitic form here, or the little cube was represented by an element from the genus. They can transport this information back to the original quadratic form capital Q. And then capital Q will also represent the quadratic form little q. Um, yeah, there's some miracle calculation and it's not complicated, but it's really a cool, clever idea. And you can look at the papers if you haven't seen it before. Yes. Um, good. So let me go one step further. Our main theorem is kind of targeted at this application. It was the application was really a driving um, motivation to obtain this Adelic equidistribution theorem. And we are able to improve the theorem of Ellenberg and Venkatesh in several aspects. So in particular, we don't need to distinguish between the case of three variables gap or five variables gap, it doesn't matter. We treat the three variable case, three variable gap case the same way as any other gap, higher than three. Um, but also we make the, the constant effective because in the theorem of Ellenberg and Venkatesh, it just says there exists a constant C of capital Q. And because they rely on technology like appearing in Moses Schaaf theorem using Ratner's measure classification, there's no way that they can make this constant effective. And we yeah, provide an, an effective version of Moses Schaaf in this context. And because of that, we also get a concrete, more concrete constant. Um, if the minimum of little q is at least an absolute constant times a power of the discriminant of capital Q, 
then little q is primitively representable by capital Q. Yeah, so there are two constants, little capital C, capital A. They only depend on N. But to be honest, they will not be very good constants. Um, we, we show their existence by a long and, and difficult argument where in some inductive scheme, they will change frequently, finitely often, but they will change frequently. And at every step, we, in principle, could compute the constants. If you have a computer that is faster than everything that exists, in principle, they could probably be computable, but we definitely don't compute them. But we prove this this type of dependence of the constant that was ineffective in the previous work. Good. Let me talk a little bit about the history of this effective uh, problem. So, not the first effective theorem of the, its sort, but somehow for the history of the theorem that I call the main theorem, this paper of mine with Magulis and Venkatesh from 2009 is kind of the birthplace of this kind of thinking. So there we needed a congruence lattice inside uh, G of R. We took an H, which has, which is also semi-simple, no compact factors and finite centralizer. So this is an important assumption here, finite centralizer. If you're given that H and you're looking at a closed orbit of H inside G mod gamma, then there would again be two constants. Um, yeah, I forget the little d. The little d is sort of a, a number of derivatives for the Sobolev norm, not so important. The statement is that for any large enough volume, volume parameter, there exists an intermediate subgroup between H and G. There are only finitely many of these, but okay. There exists one of them. So that the closed orbit of, that the S, S orbit of your initial point is a closed orbit with volume below V and mu is V to the minus delta close to this quote unquote limit, which is the H measure on this um, X zero orbit. And I can't really draw this, but let me try nonetheless by a very simple abelian analog that I can draw. So think of the two torus. And then inside the two torus, think of a um, one dimensional line that is very dense already. And per very dense, maybe one over a thousand dense or something like that. And then inside the line, you pick a discrete subgroup, but this discrete subgroup is way more complicated than a thousand. This discrete subgroup is like 10 to the 20 many points or something like that. And then there is no good answer to the question, what does the blue subgroup equidistribute to? Is it the one-dimensional line or is it the two-dimensional torus? There's no answer to that, really. It sort of depends on maybe your application or what, what you want to talk about. And um, you could say it equidistributes to the, to the line, and when you say that, you have a much better error rate, but you're actually distributing to something that's still very complicated. So maybe you're not gaining that much from the picture. Or you could say it actually distributes to the two-dimensional torus, but if you say that, you have a less, a smaller error, right? Then you have one over a thousand as an error, not one over 10 to the 20 as your error. So, and this theorem sort of says, it's up to you to choose which error you want. 
And depending on that, you need to live with a certain volume or the other way around. You accept a certain bound on the volume and then you will have a certain error that goes with that bound on the volume. And if you ask for too much, if you set your, um, your volume equal to the volume of the edge orbit, then S will equal, be equal to H and it will be trivially true and will be quite useless. Then you're just saying the orbit actually distributes to itself with an error which is zero. True, but useless. Um, yeah, so choose your poison sets somehow. That's the type of the theorem here. Okay. Um, a few years later, well, we started working on it a few years later, but it wasn't progressing very fast, as you can see in the gap of the years. We then moved to the Adelic setting um, and Amir joined the team. So that's joint work with Magulis, Mohammadi, and Venkatesh. And the, there we replaced the final centralizer assumption with an even stronger assumption. We assumed that the subgroup comes from an algebraic, from a maximal algebraic subgroup, that the orbit comes from a maximal algebraic subgroup. Um, anyway, this was also not an easy paper. So we just um, settled on as a next step. We go at Elik, but we simplify our life and work with maximal uh, groups, subgroups. Um, yeah, it was the next step somehow. Um, just like in the very first theorem, there are no unipotents mentioned. So this is, if we go back to the application of Ellenberg and Venkatesh, there are no unipotents here, right? But if we go to the theorem of Moses and Char, there are unipotents very prominently in the formulation. So how is it that the application has no unipotents, but the main theorem that is supposed to be the driving force has unipotents around? And that's precisely this, this peering extension. So by working within a peering extension, maybe the QP points of the group is not compact. And if it's semi-simple, then it will have unipotents. And then the technology and the ideas of unipotent dynamics from homogeneous dynamics can be useful. And if you go to the adelic quotient, in some sense, the adelic quotient, or the adelic orbit will never have a compact group. There will always be unipotents somewhere, but it's, the question is where precisely, and that, yeah, we'll come to that also a bit. Okay. Let me talk a little bit about the ingredients of these um, theorems, maybe all three of them, all, all these um, effective echo distribution of closed orbits. What are the ingredients? The very first I would want to mention is Clausel's property tau. Um, that's a very important ingredient for us. It gives us decay of matrix coefficients in a uniform manner. And this uniformity is important because we are trying to use this decay for the measure of the, of the uh, subgroup, for the measure sitting on the orbit of the subgroup, for y. And y is changing um, potentially. In, Nothing is allowed to depend on y, except in controlled manner. So if the decay of matrix coefficient statement would depend on y, if we wouldn't have uniformity, as was promised by closed cells property tau, we wouldn't be able to prove the theorems that we're proving. Then we also rely very heavily on these ideas of Ratner uh, and yeah, shearing arguments that have been around for a while. And in the Delic case, we also rely on Prasad's volume formula, which yeah, is an interesting twist, but existed already in the, in the Delic paper uh, from before. But let me start at something very, very basic. If you, yeah, I'm thinking of a compact quotient, maybe it's, yeah, depending on the theorem, maybe I shouldn't assume that, but let me think of a compact quotient. 
And then inside this, I have a very complicated orbit because if it's not complicated, well, there's nothing to prove. And since it's a very complicated orbit, I will see the situation that somewhere close, close by the orbit and another piece of the orbit, but that's, um, they will be close by, but transversely close by. Somewhere this needs to happen because the X is compact and pre-given and the orbit is very complicated. So just by chopping up the blue ambient space into many small boxes, some box will have to contain a picture like this. And what do I use this for? I use this um, together with the idea of generic points. So what do I mean by that? And that's what I obtained from the property tau. So let me look at, yeah. Now I'm looking only at the, the orbit y. So this y I'm drawing like this, but you should think of in our application that this y is really living inside the blue ambient x. Um, so inside this y, and my group is, the group that produces this y is semi-simple and non-compact, I assume that. And when this is true, then I can I can look at pieces of orbits under the unipotent inside an SL2. I fix an SL2 inside, inside H, my acting group, that produces the orbit. And inside the two SL2, I fix the upper triangular unipotent subgroup. And then this, this line is just the orbit of this U, a piece of the orbit of this U. And what I want is that when I go along the unipotent, say from zero to time t, if I do it in the periodics, of course, I need to use different notation, but it's still the same idea. And the average along the orbit, and I compare this to the integral with respect to my measure on y, I want this to be very small. So I want this to be like some t to the minus delta or something times maybe Sobolev norm of the function. This, if I know that for all sufficiently large t, I would call the point x zero here. I would call this point x zero like t generic or generic if this is true for all t bigger than some capital T zero. And the way to prove that there are lots of generic points is, is really surprisingly easy. Uh, the, Depending on your quantifiers, there's more work involved, but let me ignore that. The idea is you just call this a new function. This is a new function, discrepancy of f at x0. And then you do the following. You just take this function and calculate its L2 norm with respect to this measure. And yeah, it's an L2 norm, so let's just square the L2 norm. And you just use the definition, use Fubini once, and you, you obtain that this L2 norm of the discrepancy is an average of matrix coefficients for the function f. But property tau tells you that the matrix coefficients decay with a certain speed. So you actually can prove that this, this, the two norm of the discrepancy function for your function f decays at a certain speed. And this allows you to then show that most points in some effective way, like um, you only need to remove 1% of the space or something, or even less, 1% um, is okay. You, if you remove 1% of the space, all the remaining points are generic for this function. Then you need to some work so sort of to get independent of the function, but it can be done. And it really, the uniformity really comes from, from property tau. Okay. And the idea then is that you combine this picture 
with this idea of generic points and in the following way. So I need to draw my ambient space. Inside the ambient space, I have my, my complicated orbit, which is complicated, I didn't draw it correctly, and is uh, approaching itself somewhere in the space very closely, transversely. So I have here this transverse picture where this piece of the orbit and this piece of the orbit, they come together transversely. And then inside this red orbit, I have this notion of generic points where the unipotence kind of equidistribute inside the red surface very well. And I do a little bit of twiggling because I have a generic point here, I have a generic point here, and that's kind of not optimal. But by moving these points a little bit along the the orbit direction, I can actually arrange it so that the two points have a displacement, which is an invariant complement to my red subgroup, to the subgroup H. And if I then do follow the, the equidistributing orbits, like in this picture here, I can arrange it so that I get very long pieces very long pieces of orbits, both equidistribute to the space, but because I use the unipotent subgroup and I work with this displacement in the beginning that's transversal, I can arrange it so that the difference between a very long piece and another very long piece of the orbit for the same time, that this distance is kind of constant. Um, you could compare this to the following statement. If you have a parabola and the parabola is at zero close to zero, but at the right end point, a thousand, it's close to one. And in between, it's also at most one. Then when you look at the last percent of this long interval, and the last percent is very long because I went up to a thousand, right? When you look at this last 1%, the polynomial is almost constant there in this last 1% because 1% is very little in of this long interval, but itself, it's very long by itself. So you can play with these different scales and make it so that this line is equidistributing distributing in the space with respect to the measure mu d or mu y. This line is equidistributing. distributing again to the same measure, but the distance between the two is actually almost constant. And this way you get a direction from the in invariant complement that almost preserves the measure mu y. And we then start playing with, with elements that almost preserve the measure. And it kind of, it's, it's needed to talk about that because in the limit, we would have actually new directions that preserve the measure. And that's this classical point of view from ergodic theory and homogeneous dynamics, like in the theorem of Moses Shah. But we don't want to do that. We don't want to go to the limit. So we have to talk about elements in the ambient space, in the ambient group that almost preserve the measure. And by yeah, working with these unipotent orbits, we can actually arrange this to happen. And this is what I wanted to say here. And the final step is maybe if you assume that you're maximal, you take your H, you take this additional direction under which you're invariant, almost invariant, up to some error that you need to control. And then you try to generate a group out of these two pieces. Take the old age that you're actually invariant, you take this one parameter subgroup under which you're almost invariant and you try to generate a group. If you can generate maybe all of G, question mark, 
And if you can do this effectively without using too many products, without using too large elements of the one parameter subgroup or also of H, if you can do this effectively, then you will show that your measure mu is almost invariant under all small enough elements of G. And then you can use the spectral gap of G to say that the limit measure must be very close to the, or that the measure of mu y needs to be very, very, very close to the uniform measure on the whole space. Okay. Um, so that was kind of the picture if you are in the real setting. If you're not in the real setting, then you need to choose a good prime. And I was promising that you, that we sort of need Prosat's volume formula for that. But let me um, explain it in a special case. If Y is an SO or maybe a spin of a quadratic form, like the little quadratic form, U. Um, no, I should say um, H. If H is the spin of a quadratic form Q, and P does not divide the discriminant of Q, then H of QP will contain unipotence. But there's this classical theorem from the theory of quadratic forms that if your quadratic form has at least five variables and you look at the orthogonal group, then the orthogonal group, will, uh, the quadratic form will represent zero non-trivially over QP. And that means that your orthogonal group over QP will not be compact. And since we are semi-simple, semi will contain unipotence. If your quadratic form has three variables, then this is not true. But if your prime does not divide the discriminant, say prime is three or above, uh, then the same statement will be true. So choose P such that P does not divide the discriminant and is smallest. And then it's kind of a game where you just apply the prime number theorem, where you ask yourself, if you have some number, some discriminant of a quadratic form, you have some number, and you look for this first prime that does not divide it, how large can that be in terms of this number discriminant? And you, yeah very easy estimate would be at most log of the disc discriminant. So the, the prime, this good prime that you can use is much smaller than the error that you want to obtain because discriminant height complexity for quadratic form is always more or less the same. So you will not if the prime sort of hurts you in some estimates, you do make some rounding errors and the, the prime will appear frequently with some power. And if you find the many steps of the argument, which you will have, and then at the end you have P to the 100 as part of your error, you will just say good enough because the prime will be logarithmic in the discriminant and there will be power saving in terms of a negative power of the discriminant and then the P to the 100 is not a problem. So we choose a prime like this and in the quadratic case, it's very concrete. You just need to do that. But if it's an, an orbit defined by some semi-simple subgroup that you don't know so well, then you just have to dig into the general theory, and this is where we use Brassard's volume formula for the same purpose. And the argument goes like this, if your H is not quasi split at the prime P, then this prime will push the volume up a little bit. And if your 
your age that you're looking at is not good reduction at P, then again, this will push up your volume a little bit. And it, this little bit will always be a power of the prime. So in the end, you play the same game. You just, again, use the regular prime number theorem, but combined with Brassard's volume formula to choose a prime that's kind of small in terms of the complexity of the orbit that you're looking at. Yeah, of course I had more things prepared. Um, we need all of these things and we also were kind of motivated by a recent theorem of Andreas Wieser because he was able to generalize the real theorem from 2009 where we needed a centralizer assumption. He was able to do this, uh, I don't, I've forgotten how many, couple of years ago, but it took him also a while to boil it down and write it up and now it's an archive. Um, so we were motivated by his breakthrough and that sort of gave us the push to then work out the, the induction that we need to do and to overcome the centralizer issue in a different way and I, I think I'm running out of time. It's kind of amazing that we do all of this, but we also need an effective version of Greenberg's theorem that appeared in another work of, of Mohammadi, Ellenberg and Shah, I think, and Magulis. Um, so they also needed it for similar purposes, this effective version of Greenberg's theorem. And we also need it just many times. And um, the proof of this, you can rely maybe on Grudner basis. And it's Grudner basis is effective, right? They are an algorithm. So in principle, the constants that appear in this theorem are computable. And they, these probably not so small constants will appear in our argument in an iterated scheme where we induct them on a dimension so that kind of tells you um, that our constants will not be pretty if you try to compute them. But I think I'm running out of time, so let me stop here.